From the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, this is Human Centered. Caregiving receives much less academic attention compared with other kinds of social relationships. Even as we face crises of both elder care and child care in the U.S. and elsewhere, and even as the demands for the skills of care workers, essential yet undervalued and underrespected, skyrockets. Our cultural and social institutions and markets and the traditional types of social contracts they enshrine are all ill-equipped to accommodate the unique structures of caregiving relationships, which often feature asymmetries of power, reciprocity, and autonomy. If we want to care more about caregiving, we need to explore and reimagine the philosophical, psychological, political, biological, and economic foundations of care and caregiving. And we need to foreground a post-neoliberal set of values more explicitly in our explorations and build an interdisciplinary synthesis that advances policy discussions. Today on Human Centered, a conversation between Alison Gopnik, Margaret Levy, and Anne-Marie Slaughter, recorded live in front of an audience at CASBIS in January 2024. The gathering coincided with the convening of a workshop for a CASBIS project called The Social Science of Caregiving, of which the three guests are key participants. It's led by Gopnik, a 2003-4 CASBIS fellow and renowned cognitive and developmental psychologist and author of, among other books, The Philosophical Baby and The Gardener and the Carpenter, what the new science of child development tells us about the relationship between parents and children. Margaret Levy is a political scientist and former CASBIS director who helped steer the project and notably led CASBIS's project titled Creating a New Moral Political Economy, which in many ways inspired the launch of the caregiving project. She is co-author of the book, In the Interest of Others. Anne-Marie Slaughter is the CEO of New America, former dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, former director of policy planning at the U.S. State Department, and also known for Unfinished Business, a book about the importance of valuing care. You're about to hear these brilliant thinkers detangling and probing some of the key issues and challenges necessary for arriving at a coherent, empirical, and theoretical account of the general features of care and caregiving. You'll hear them thinking out loud together, deeply listening and learning from one another, as well as some terrific questions from the audience, all hallmarks of what makes CASBIS such a remarkable place. As always, links to full bios and relevant publications are in the episode notes, but for now, let's listen. It's really exciting to me and a pleasure to be with two of my favorite people in a conversation about care and caregiving, which has become an extraordinarily, it's always been an important issue, let's be honest, but we've become much more alert to it, particularly as the demography changes, as the, the systems of government that affect our social insurance systems change, and as our understanding of care changes, thanks in part to the two people next to me. Um, I want to give a little background to this project, and then we'll move into the actual conversation. Uh, one of the programs that CASBIS ran for several years was on creating a new moral political economy, how to think about a political economic framework that works for the contemporary era. And like all political economies, has values in it, and we wanted to make them explicit. And one of those values, and one of the concerns about a new moral political economy, is really bringing f into the front and center of it, how are we going to deal with issues of care? Care for all kinds of people at all kinds of stages of life with all kinds of particular needs and issues. And out of that interest in care, we asked Alison Gopnik to help us think through those questions, as well as later Anne-Marie. And, and out of that then emerged a new project that focused particularly on care and thinking about how the social sciences and other disciplines um, in our larger group are not only political scientists and philosophers and neuroscientists and another political scientist lawyer as well, um, but also sociologists, psychologists, and medical people. So it's not so much about the medicality of care that we're concerned about 
as about the kinds of structures that we can provide for care, the kinds of values and the way we think about care as, as we'll hear. Um, so we're really a very interdisciplinary project, which is one of the things, of course, that CASPIS is renowned for, and we're using that as a strength in order to build some new thinking and some new reimagining around care. With that, I wanna to turn to my two colleagues and friends here to really have them present initially uh, sort of how they came to this subject, a very brief history, because each of us has very long <laughs> histories of, of involvement in the, in, the, in the questions, but most importantly, to really begin to present how you would think about the challenges, the framework, the way we need to proceed to go into the future on these questions. Uh, let me start with Alison Gopnik. So I'm a cognitive scientist. So what I do is try and figure out how it is that people find out about the world, are intelligent about the world, make decisions about the world. Often this is in the context of thinking about how a computer or an artificial system could do the same thing. And I'm also a developmental psychologist. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about and being with children. And you know, it took until I was in my 60s to think about this particular aspect of human intelligence, namely the intelligence that's involved in care. And of course, if you're spending time thinking about children, this is extremely vivid because the children can't exist without caregiving. I mean, literally can't exist without caregiving. And yet, caregiving is almost invisible in economics, in political science, and in cognitive science as well. So we know a lot, for example, about what's been called theory of mind, work we did back in the 80s. How do we understand other people's minds? How do we think about other people's minds? More recently, we've done a lot of work on what people sometimes call intuitive sociology. How do we think about things like group identity, in groups and out groups, hierarchies? And we've learned a lot about the kinds of cognitive structures that underpin that. And yet, in spite of the fact that both in our everyday lives and in um, and it, from an evolutionary perspective, care is one of the most important things we do, we haven't thought about it. We don't know what our everyday conceptions of care are like. We don't know exactly what the evolutionary history is that's led us to have the kinds of understandings of care that we, we do. We don't have a sense of the sort of distinctive intelligence of care, which is different. We don't have a sense of the distinctive economics of care, which is different from... Uh, from standard economics. And as I was saying to Margaret when we were preparing for this, it's not even so much that we're rethinking care, we're just thinking care, <laughs> um, just paying any attention to this at all. Um, and you know, we ha also have a 2,000 year long history of philosophy, um, which is my other hat. And in the 1968 Encyclopedia of Philosophy, there were four references to children parents' childhood. You could read the entire thing and think that human beings reproduced by asexual cloning. <laughs> and there were, in tomes of moral philosophy, you could read those tomes of moral philosophy and never realize that an important moral issue for people is how they take care of their helpless, uh, their helpless loved ones. So it, it has been this kind of amazing absence. And that is also an opportunity for us as, as social scientists to try and try and fill in some of that absence. And of course, as Margaret said, the policy uh, implications of it are clear and important. And oddly enough, I mean, I think people have paid more attention to the policy than they have to the psychology and philosophy. So people are concerned about what the right policy decisions are. But I think just like you can't make good policy decisions in politics or economics without having some kind of theoretical understanding of politics or economics, it's, we aren't going to be able to make the right decisions if we don't have some broader intellectual understanding of care. So Anne-Marie, you're someone who has been very deeply engaged with policy, but you're also really thinking about this issue in a quite deep theoretical way about re, well, thinking care. I, th I like <laughs> that. Care. <laughs> um, and, and really imagining um, a very different set of approaches to care. And when we come, at some point, I want to start parsing care so it's not just about parents and children, but mm -hmm. let's move on to you and, and how you came to this and how you're beginning to think care. So I have to start by saying two things. One, I couldn't be happier both to be part of this project and that this project, 
project is happening, to build a solid academic foundation under care and the necessity of care and the impact of care is just a godsend for the people who have been working in policy. But the second thing I have to say is that I'm the generation of feminists from the 70s and the 80s who fled anything that looked like traditional family. When I started my career as a law professor, I remember you know, Martha Field, who was the first law professor tenured at Harvard Law School, did family law. Martha Minow then went into family law. Absolutely not. The way to legitimacy and success, uh, and particularly in foreign policy, which is my area, was to be to do what the boys did. You know, you did guns and bombs. And <laughs> it was. So the idea that I would now be sitting here embracing and talking about care I could absolutely could not have imagined. And I got there through writing the article in The Atlantic in 2012, which some of you will know, uh, Why Women Still Can't Have It All. And when I wrote that article, I was really focusing on the workplace. It was, you know, here are the changes we still need to make if we are ever going to get to anything like real gender equality. And I didn't think about care. And at that point still, you know, my, my sort of the... My self-worth and the way I thought about what women needed was much more focused on doing the work that our fathers did, not the work that our mothers did. But after that article came out and I started working on a book called Unfinished Business, I really realized, you know, we are never going to get to gender equality unless we can value the work that women traditionally did as much as the work that men traditionally did. And for the more set, the first second wave feminists, I absolutely understand why you couldn't do that. You couldn't have done that back in the 60s and 70s. And when Betty Friedan published her second book that was much more focused on family, nobody really wanted to hear it. Um, but it's just common, I mean, you just do the numbers. You know, you can't have women doing all the work that women traditionally did and, men, and, and what men did and men only doing one. And so from that, I got to, so we have to value that work. So we have to think about what that work is. And I read a little book called On Caring by a philosopher, not a philosopher quite, I think, at your level, uh, a guy named Milton Meyendorf, uh, who wrote it in 1971. So you have a male philosopher who writes a book called On Caring. And he talks about it as being a father, but also being a creator, that you are investing in something else. And you are both putting yourself into it. And Allison, it's very much the way you've written about it. And you are letting that thing, that child, but he also talks about symphonies and poems, take on a life of its own, which is the way a lot of composers and authors actually talk about their work. And that got me thinking about, wait a minute, this is work where we invest in another, and it doesn't have to be a biologically related other. And one of the ways you know it's care is when they succeed, you're just as happy as if you succeeded. And which is not always true in our world, right? We have even our friends, when they succeed, there can be a little twinge of, of you know, wishing that you had. Care is a different way of relating. So for the last 10 years, running New America, I have written extensively on, how, on the need to value care. And New America and other organizations have worked on improving the lives of caregivers, raising the wages of caregivers, I can't talk about care without saluting Ai Jen Poo, who really has driven the modern care movement. And last October, I was at CareFest in LA, the first ever meeting of 500 care leaders from across the country. You had union leaders, you had uh, home health aid workers, you had, uh, academics. It was really quite something. Um, and that work is, you know, now we talk about building an infrastructure of care, which failed. But we talked about it. iGen had mentioned that back as early as 2009. Uh, and so what I now see this project as, again, is there's that policy work, and it's so important. But we will get much further if we can actually put this foundation under it. So in talking about what the foundation is, uh, both of you and in my own work as well, none of us buy the model of self-interest as driving uh, behavior certainly narrow self-interest. I mean, obviously people have interests and they act on them, but that narrow self-interest cannot be what the basis of the caregiving relationship is. And so maybe you could each expand on that a little bit. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the basic, from the perspective of the kind of work that I do, the social contract has been the sort of basic formal structure for thinking about human relations, at least since the Enlightenment. And if you look at even mathematical accounts of the origins of altruism, they're all based on this idea, which is actually a lovely idea that you have individuals, they're pursuing goals independently of one another, and then they discover that they can trade off goals and the result is that you can end up, um, you can end up in a positive sum game as opposed to a, a negative sum game. Everybody can do better as a result of trading off interests um, with one another. And a lot of work in moral psychology, that's obviously the foundational model for economics, it's the foundational model for enlightenment politics. And one thing that I've thought about is you can think of a lot of the um, uh, institutional achievements of the enlightenment as really being kind of forms of software that let you scale up the social contract. So if you think about markets on the one hand, political democracies and states on the other hand, those are all ways of being able to have these contractual relationships, not just between two people in the village, but literally across, across the planet. And I genuinely think those are great accomplishments. But if you think about care, it's kind of like the anti-social contract. Because what happens, you think about this, this model, this picture of here's agent A and here's agent B, and they both have utilities and they both have resources. The social contract picture is each of them is just trying to pursue their utilities and figuring out how to do it. And you can also have power relationships where A has more resources than B, and that means that B has to subordinate their goals to A's. That's a very common, you can think of that as being kind of not the liberal enlightenment picture, but say the Marxist picture generally construed. But what happens in care? You've got one agent who has more resources than the other and has different goals than the other. And exactly because you have more resources than your infant does or than your patient does or than your student does, you subordinate your goals to the goals of the patient or the student or the infant. And I think it's important that it isn't just a kind of solidarity relationship, something that Margaret and others have talked about. You could think, well, OK, what happens is sometimes people pool their resources and their utilities. So you say, OK, we're in a group, and we all have the same goals. It's not even just that you're happy when the person you care for accomplishes their goals. It's even weirder than that, because even if you don't have the same goals as the person you're caring for, and sometimes even if you think that the person you're caring for shouldn't have those goals, that they should have other goals, hello, anybody who's had a teenage child, <laughs> um, you still feel as if you want them to have the autonomy to be able to accomplish those goals. Or you think about you know, anyone who's also had an elderly, um, an elderly parent. You want them to be in a position where they can do something that you think is not necessarily the best thing for them. So it's, it's a really, and, and as Margaret's pointed out, this isn't just, I, I think the er example of this and probably the evolutionarily foundational one is this relationship between mammalian mothers and babies. But it's clear that by the time you're talking about humans, this applies to friends, it applies to students, it applies to patients, it applies to animals, non-human animals. It applies to the environment. In all of these cases, you have this abstract structure where because you have more resources, you uh, spontaneously think that what you should do with those resources is follow the goals, uh, fulfill the goals of another agent who, be precisely because they don't have as many resources. But as because you, you care about them. But because you care about them. And that's what happens in relationships of care that makes them really different from relationships of power or relationships of social contract. But of course, the question that we've talked about some is, if you think about someone like the people that Anne-Marie was just talking about, professional caregivers, um, there's an interesting argument that that very fact that makes care so morally profound and deep and important also means that that's a way you can get away with not paying people well, right? Because if the, if the work is being done because it's morally satisfying to care for someone, then that's not a social contract. And you want, when you're talking about salaries, you kind of want a social contract. Uh, uh, you want a social contract structure. And it's very, very easy to turn, for this to turn into care relationships, to turn into power relationships. That's what happens when we talk about something being paternalistic, for example, right? I mean, there's a reason why we use the word paternalistic but to mean But it's not just power relations. And this may get into some of Anne Marie's concern, too. It's also transactional relations. Yeah. So given the world as it's structured right now, I can't imagine getting 
everyone who cares for a child or an, or an older person or a disabled person being someone who cares deeply about them in that moral sense. Some of those people are simply paid, hopefully trained well, hopefully good-hearted, um, hopefully not abusive, but nonetheless paid. It's a transaction. And I know you have some reactions to that, Anne-Marie. I do, and I, I'm going to start just by saying I am still really wrestling with, 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 with the, yeah. these parts because this is very complicated. So just to start with the, um, just the semantics of it. So one way to restate what you just said is you care for people you care about. Right. But actually that can be a tautology because if I say I care for you, I'm actually saying I care about you. So to get to what you're saying, you have to say, I take care of you, although we never call humans caretakers, which is another thing, but I take care of you because I care about you. Mm -hmm. But that takes you to where Margaret is, and I think she's right, that yes, you take care of people because you care about them, but that is not necessarily love or affection. It's not even the friend, it's not the, uh, the family relations, the friend relations, it's more I am invested in your success in some way. Now you might be because you're paid to do it, but I think what I, where I, I start from a different place. So I'm gonna now switch gears and, and, and talk about how I get there. I start from the proposition that we must think of care as a relationship and not a service. And now that's very important from an economic point of view because we can't, we don't have a category for valuing relations, relationships. You know, we, we take account of goods and services and care is a service and it is bathing or feeding or driving, all the things we do, and those are all taken account of in the economy. They are not paid for when they're done as labors of love, right? <laughs> and so, but there's, they're seen as a service. And I think that, to start with, you have to say that's wrong that a robot can perform those services, but it's, and does. <laughs> but I don't, I think that's not care. I think care is a relationship between two people that at its most intense is a relationship of love. And almost, Allison, you talk about the expansion of the self, that you really feel like that person and you are, are fused uh, in some way. But it, doesn't have to be. It can also be a relationship, could be of affection, but could just be of respect and uh, awareness of the dignity and autonomy of the other. And so that to me is still care. If you think about, you talk about, and I agree with you, teachers and students, therapists and clients, mentors and mentees. I mean, I definitely care deeply about my mentees, but it's not necessarily love or affection. It's this sense of pride in their success and my investing uh, in that, that is a form of, of, you might want to call it care plus, but it's definitely on the care spectrum. So I don't quite, I know it's a relationship. I don't think it requires the kind of love and affection that many of our care relationships uh, are, are motive, are express, but I think it can't, it can't be if you if I take care of you and I provide those services and I'm mean or I don't respect your dignity, that's not care. We need that's something else, and we need to to understand how to talk about that. So for both of you, I hear the notion of care really coming from the parenting relationship. Because what you start with is this fusion of self with the other, and then there are varieties that move away from that. Um, so one of the questions that we've been raising in the piece that I'm co-authoring um, with Andy Elder, who is here, and um, I think Renak is here, Trevetti, um, is really thinking about you know, we when, with parents and children, if we see a child sitting on the sidewalk by yeah. itself, we hold that parent responsible for leaving that child on the sidewalk by itself. If we see an elderly person sitting on the sidewalk by herself, we don't know who to go to. Do we go to her children? Do we go to the police? I mean, it's a different, so I'm just trying to 
open up this box so that caring doesn't just become an image of the parent with the child. It's so much more complicated than that. Well, I mean, of course, the thing that's interesting, and Sarah Hurdy, I guess, is not here for this workshop, but has been, has been part of this, is that even from an evolutionary perspective, one of the things that I think we have good reason to believe is most distinctive about humans is that even for parents and children, we're not just parents and children. So we have evolved alloparents from very, very early on in our in our evolutionary, I mean, from as, as soon as we were homo sapiens, we had many different people involved in care for children because human care is so labor intensive and it's so difficult. So even compared to other mammals, we're already, you know, our care is already not just the care. It involves, and it involves cooperation among different caregivers as well. So we, we sort of are in a situation where we have to care for the other caregivers who are involved in, in uh, in children, in taking care of children. And I, th I think there's a good argument that that's the, the, even the neural pathways, and we have people who can talk to that, talk to that here, um, get exapted, as it were, for other kinds of care and, uh, care and cooperation. Um, uh, Sarah's new book, which isn't out yet, but which I fortunately got to read in proofs, that's, there's a bit of name dropping for you. Um, uh, <laughs> is about fathers, and she has these beautiful examples of looking at this kind of natural experiment of gay fathers who were adopting children now. And then you look at their brain activation, and it looks like their brains have been, have, are looking like the brains of mothers. Um, and my guess is that you'd find similar kinds of things if you were looking at all sorts of uh, other, kinds of, care other kinds of care relations. So I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's got this broader character, but it's always had, in some sense, it's always had this broader character. But what you're bringing in is it's not just a dyadic relationship. It's really a very, it's a, it's a community yeah. relationship. There's cooperation among various individuals. I know some of what you talk about is the role that grandparents pay. Yeah, that's right. And we know that grandparents the, have been there as long as we've... Uh, and, uh, this is an empirical empirical question that I think you were asking, yes. Margaret, and I've been asking all my anthropologist friends, and there, there may be people here who have a sense of it. Like, when do we start caring for elderly people? Um, you know, is that, in, you could certainly tell a story about the fact that we rely on elders so heavily for children to survive, which we have really good evidence for, and that we rely on elders to pass on cultural information, which is another thing that's very distinctive and important about humans, and we have good evidence for. Both of those are reasons why we might feel that we wanted to, to care, I mean, evolutionary uh, reasons, as it were, why we might want to care for, uh, for elders. But I think it's quite up for grabs about when does that start, how do we, you know, would we, when do people start caring for elders outside of that healthy 55 to 75 postmenopausal um, and when, uh, when and who does the society hold responsible for that but let's oh yeah, one more thing I want to mention which I think is relevant to this um, this is something that Zach comes up which is that religious traditions also have this structure so when you were talking about you know being further a bodhisattva or a, a Christ is supposed to have the same relationship with everybody that you have with your child or that you have with the person that you really care about so, and that's been a sort of picture for as long, I think, as we've had, uh, as, as long as we've had that kind of religious, those kind of religious traditions. I'm sorry, I just wanted to bring that in. No, no, I think that's important. And I, I loved uh, the point about, you know, elder people transmitting. We're, we're there with elephants and whales, which is a really great yeah, place to be. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> in terms of the animals that also do that. So I think care is a relationship. I think care is a relationship that is not just motivated by love or affection. Um, but then you have to ask yourself, so what's not care? So another way to kind of get at this is to say, what, what, is, what is not care? And to me, and again, I, Allison, I was so struck by your argument about the expansion of the self. And lots of, again, if you read, you read about parents, they talk about that. But you read about lovers, they talk about that. And when you talk, about, when you talk to children caring for parents, what you often hear is that they came to a completely different understanding of their parent and themselves. And it, 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 I mean, and again, you're not sugarcoating that this is all lovely, but they're, they're, I was saying 
40% of male caregivers at, at home for parents now are men. And they talk about, um, and for non-paid caregivers, uh, family caregivers are, are men. And again, for all the kind of difficulties of caring for an elder person, it, it, it's a profound experience. So what I want to then say is, so maybe care, and in its broadest interpretation, its broadest spectrum, is that relationship that shapes your mutual identity. So it's very easy with parenting. You're a mother or a father. You are a child. You are a sibling. You are a spouse. Those are all very easy. You are a friend, and being a friend is part of your identity, at least for most of us, right? I, I definitely define myself as a friend. I define myself as a mentor, as a teacher. You can broaden that out. I am being, my identity is actually being shaped by that relationship with the other person until you get to consumer, and there are others. But no, when you get to transactional relationships, I, am not, I do not define myself as a consumer or a customer. That is not part of, of the sort of mutual construction of identity that I think might be, you might be able to use that to bound what, what are the relationships that would give rise to care you're still not taking account of the paid one, paid relationship. But at least I'm trying. I'm really trying to get get it hard at what is what does bound that relationship we call care. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we've been doing in the project is trying to point to here's features of here's features that seem to be distinctively features of care. Do people actually treat those features as if they were distinctive? And so some of the candidates um, are this idea of locality, the fact that you're. You don't care about everybody. You don't care about everybody equally unless you're a bodhisattva, right? You know, the rest of us, us mere mortals, can't do that. So it's a relationship you have with a specific person, and that makes it different from, say, a market relationship, where the idea is you could, in anybody. principle, have a market relationship with anybody who's in the market, right? Um, um, another one is now. Here's an interesting case where I think maybe I would disagree with what you were just saying, Anne Marie. Another one is this asymmetry. So you can have these solidarity relationships with a spouse or with a friend or with you know, your department or with CASBAs where we're all, we feel as if our identity is in this larger group and we even you know, would say, well, CASBAs decided to do X and Y or, or you know, the department is excelling this year or something like that. Um, and we become part of the department. I think there's something about the asymmetry. There's something about the fact that in caring relationships, you don't have equal resources. You don't have equal uh, equal capacities. That makes them different from, you know, there, there's the quality of expending, extending the self, but it's a really interesting way of extending the self, which isn't like the uh, the kind of solidarity extension of the self. And, you know, even if you think about lovers, for example, it feels like um, I... Part of the reason I got interested in this was that my husband was really, really sick for a year, and I was suddenly in the position of, of caring for him. And even with spousal relationships, which you want to be equal, you do have this sort of sense that if your spouse got really, really sick and wasn't the you know lively uh, uh, person that you'd married, how would you feel? Would you take care of them? And you sort of feel like, you know, if you would disappear, if you would bugger off, then then you're not really, that's not really love, right? That's not, that doesn't really count as being love. That's kind of like the acid test for whether it's a relationship of caring or love. Sorry, I, go ahead. No, no, but again, the, the, we're, we're, the semantics are tricky. Like God care, you, the, I care about you, God caring about us, the bodhisattva, all that. That's not the care part that we're trying to tease out, right? right? The, that, and that's again, we have to focus on care as taking care of someone, because caring about, that's way too broad. So taking care of someone, I agree with you that there's an asymmetry. In some cases, you might say there's expected reciprocity, right? So I'll take care, you know, we, we pledge when we marry to, you know, in sickness and in, in health. But I agree with you that there's, there's this idea that you, are, you have more resources and you are subordinating, you're either spending those resources on the other person or doing something you really don't particularly want to do because you have this relationship with the other but person. But the other side of it that I think 
you're pointing out, Allison, is that it's a power asymmetry too. It may be a short-term power asymmetry, mm -hmm. but it is a power asymmetry. So you have power over your child. You have power over the sick person, old or young or disabled, um, in terms of making certain decisions on their behalf or giving them certain things or not giving them certain things. So, I mean, I think the kind of care relation you're talking about, to really pull it out to the fullest, we have to bring some power into that. And is that true of doctor, patient, and therapist, client, and mentor, mentee, too? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly, you know, for people in this audience, if you think about your graduate students, right, that's exactly the thing that makes it hard to be a mentor is that there's one sense in which this is obviously and transparently a power relationship where you have the power and you can write the reference letters and, and they can. And yet all of us, I think, feel like that, if that's the relationship, you've, there's something that's wrong about it. That, that the sense in which the mentor is willing to say, um, you know, that's a, a research topic that I'm not really wanting to pursue, but you know, if you need to pursue it, then I'm going to give you the resources to I'm going to give you the resources to pursue it, or the strange sense in which you're happiest when your graduate students go off and do the thing that you never would have thought of and that you, on many occasions, told them was a really foolish project and that was never going to, was never going to succeed, right? Like, all of us can recognize that that's when you really feel like, I have been a good teacher, right? So we only have a few minutes before I want to open it up to uh, the audience for questions. And there are t at least two big questions on the issues on the table. One, we're going to skirt for the moment because I think it's implied, which is gender and the yeah. role yeah. that gender plays in all of this. And the other is technology, which both of you have addressed in different ways. So there's the question of technology and how it helps or hurts um, in the caring relationship. And there's the question of technology, something that you've addressed quite explicitly, Allison, about how machines need mothers. Right. Um, <laughs> I haven't that. You haven't, that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, so let's start with how technology helps or hurts this, and, and then maybe we can get to how machines need mothers and value alignment problems with the kind of technology that we're introducing. Well, I think I'll just start with the easiest, to me, the easiest proposition, which is uh, as we develop socially assistive robot, robots, um, we will make the actual physical caregiving much easier. I mean, when you when you look at home health aides, or if you have a parent or anyone, when you try to lift somebody who's a dead weight, um, you know, it's 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 very hard to do. It's disastrous for your back. Uh, and many of the the home health aides or the caregivers uh, are you know need care themselves in lots of ways. So it makes the job easier. It. It, can, it I, I think we will very quickly get to the point where it just makes the job better for both the, the person who's the caregiver or the carer, I prefer the British, uh, or and the person being cared for because it'll help you preserve your privacy and dignity. A robot will help you get to the bathroom and not. Uh, so that will be much better all around. Um, but it also will do a lot of the things that right now are hard to do um, and not well paid and allow the caregiver to focus on, if it's a child, you know, what now, the more I've learned about the development of children's brains, the more I think, oh my God, I needed to know a whole lot more, <laughs> or it would have been better. I mean, I, I, it was fine, but wouldn't it be great if you could spend time doing developmentally appropriate stuff as you're talking to the child, what, bathing and feeding and all of that, but similarly, taking care of anyone and, or an elder where that there's so much more to the job if the physical parts can be taken care of. So I see a much brighter future uh, with, for home health, home care with a lot of technology. The, the last thing I will say there also, and we know this, as you, may, you bring more technology into a job, men are more attracted to that job and then the, and then the uh, um, wages go up. So that will be good for the overwhelming number of black and brown women who do most of our elder care and home health care. And a lot of nannies do. Yeah, the, the, 
one thing, I think that's right. It is worth saying that robots are terrible now. I mean, we're, they're really, really amazingly awful. I spend half of my time with roboticists. And one thing that you can, it is a dead giveaway, is whenever they show you one of the videos of what their robot can do, you'll see it says 10x on the top. And what 10x means is we've sped this up by 10 times. <laughs> because otherwise, you'll, what you'd be watching is this incredibly painful, awkward slow process for the And they robots. still can't fold towels, right? And they still can't fold towels. Um, but they do use them in Japan already, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there are things, there are things that they can do, but I, I think we underestimate just how uh, uh, peeling ginger, I, I have saw a robot. Now, to be fair. That is hard, that peeling is hard, ginger. But like this was the standard, was our robots can peel cucumbers. Not ginger. We don't think they can peel ginger, but we're starting to get them so they can peel cucumbers. Um, uh, but uh, the other side of it is, if we ever do think about having uh, artificial systems that have some intelligence and autonomy, I don't think we're really in the ballpark of doing that now, but if we do, then we have this famous alignment problem, which is how will we get them to have the same goals that we do? How will we get them to do the right things and not the wrong things? Not turn everybody in the world into paper clips, for example, to use the, the Nick Bostrom example. And the interesting thing about that is the way that that's often phrased is, well, what we'll do is we'll just train them to have our goals. We'll train them to look at us and know what we want and do what we want. And that's kind of a creepy picture, right? I mean, that's kind of a picture of having them as a kind of slave, right, where the slavery is built in. And if you actually had something that was intelligent and autonomous, you wouldn't, or at least you could argue that that's not the relationship you want. The relationship you want is for them to be able to set up goals for themselves. That's Clara and the Sun. Right, yeah, exactly. For them to have a kind of, uh, for them to have a kind of autonomy. Um, now, how can you have that? How can you have autonomy and have good goals at the same time? Well, that's a problem that we have with every single time we raise a child. Every <laughs> child we've ever raised, we have this problem about how do we get them to have goals that are like our goals, but we know that they're not going to be, we don't want them to be the same as our goals, because that's the whole point of having a new generation. That's a problem that is central to thinking about care. It's, and you've mentioned this several times, this balance between autonomy and uh, autonomy and, and, and having goals that are good, right? Autonomy and utility. That's a really fundamental thing. And I think it comes up even in, you know, Picking someone up, doing this very physical, um, doing this very physical kind of care. If you're holding a baby, um, and people who study infancy have talked about this, the way that infants are molding to your body, and yet you have to figure out how to hold them so they can do that in a way that lets them actually be making some of the decisions about what their their uh, their posture is. So I think that's a very deep thing that we're going to have to ha think about if we're if we are going to ever have any. Uh, genuinely autonomous or intelligent agents. And maybe I was thinking about this as we were coming. To some extent, even if we don't have, you know, AGI, we do have that relationship to our artifacts, too. And this is something that I think will come up. We think about care as just being human, but to some extent, you know, we feel like we need to respect the artistic achievements of the past. And we feel as if, um, if someone came in and smashed up Casbahs, that that would be uh, physically, that, that would be a horrible thing. That we need to think about how we feel about our houses, or we feel or the about planet, the or, land, or the planet, the or land, or, exactly, or gardens. Um, it's not necessarily that we do that because they'll extend our utilities. Maybe we have our national parks because it's nice to visit the national parks. But, but there's also a sense in which we feel like we have uh, resources and responsibilities to care for those, those, uh, those systems in this broader. Um, in this broader way. And, and again, this alignment issue about, even if you're thinking about something like a national forest, you feel, even though it sounds sort of strange, you sort of feel like, well, it should have its own goals. You know, my goal might be to go and visit and go camping and have a beautiful time, but what I'm doing when I'm preserving it is I have some implicit sense that there's a um, uh, uh, you know, there's a stable ecology that it should have. Well, there's a whole a, movement right now about giving rivers and rights. Yes, right. Giving yeah, exactly. them a voice, giving them a, a decision-making power in some sense. So I'll just, uh, this is, this conversation has helped. I think, again, 
we keep flipping between care as a service, which I've said isn't care, unless it, it is accompanied by attachment. So care as attachment is what I think we're really trying to, to get at, which must infuse those services to be care. But you then really does leave wide open what you know, where iGen or any of the people yeah. that I've been working with would start, which is right. no, there are people who are caregivers and this is what they do and what they do is not valued. Yeah. And you're not going to get there by insisting they love or right. feel affection for, for their people. So there's still a gaping hole in the argument. <laughs> but, but I think what is clear, and then we'll go to questions, um, is that there's, that that attachment has an emotional a strong emotional element. And one of the limits of robots right yeah. now yeah. Yes. is that it may be, as in the Japanese, some of the Japanese cases, there is an emotional attachment yeah, from the person the using the uh, robot to the robot. But does the robot have an emotion that it can convey, that it cares, that its body can be molded, that it's concerned and that's the thing we haven't so it's more than value alignment I mean that is it's also this introduction of the emotional arrangements um, in this relationship that create the kind of thing that you mean by care so let us open it up to the rest of you to see what you want to do so I'm Megan Gunner and one of the things that struck me throughout this whole conversation, how deeply embedded it has been in our own cultural perspective. There are cultures where the whole issue is obligation. And a network, and I don't care what you feel for me, these are, and there are many cultures where we don't want our kids to grow up to be independent. That would be an anathema. So I wonder, as we think about this, how we can begin, to, and, and sometimes I think when we look at evolution, we take the pieces of it that fit nicely with our own cultural perspective and sort of ignore the rest. So I really think as we talk about this, we need to step back and think about how much our thinking and framing of all of this has been embedded in our own. And also, we're Americans. We are so freaking individualist that you have to want to do this. It is a choice. And we're, of course, seeing what's happening is many young people are choosing not to have children. So I'm going to keep you at the question level. You're absolutely right. And the larger project does attempt to do that. You heard a piece of it. But I will let each of you try to respond to that as well, if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, the empirical question, exactly what we're doing in this empirical, this empirical project is saying, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about this in terms of the caregivers. We just don't know. I mean, do people who are professional caregivers feel as if it's important to have an emotional relation? We just, it's just an empirical question that we could find out about. If Do you need to have these features of asymmetry and locality? Do you have them across different kinds of cultures and different traditions? Do people feel differently about it? I think the sort of prima facie point, and Barbara Rogoff uh, uh, responded when we were talking about this, is that actually in most cultures, care is more deeply embedded in the, in the cultural practices and institutions. By the, time you're, you know, by the time you're 15, you've cared for many, many children, and you've been cared for by many, many people. And some and part of me... Not necessarily by choice. There's an obligatory thing. Well, I mean, so that's a question, right? That's a question. Is it, is that's it, an empirical question. An empirical question. Do you feel as if these, to what extent are these things issues of And I think those are great solidarity. questions, and that's part of what we're trying to open up, is that space to really think about that. So well, thank I, you for the... I would just say, so my husband always says, he, wor he went to uh, South Korea for six months right after he was graduated from college, and he was hanging out with his Korean friends, and he was stunned that they would say things like, oh, I really don't like my mother. Because, exactly, he always explained it as you did, that there was no question he was going to take care of his mother. And since that was very clear, he did not, he, he did not have to sort of love her to motivate the care. And so I do think, I think there is a lot, I think the way I'd frame the question you asked, which we need to look at, is to what extent does my, and both of us, this assumption that it's motivated at least by close attachment, affection, to what extent is that because it isn't a structure of obligation? Thank you for this exceptionally lucid and broad-ranging conversation. My name is Mitchell Stevens. I'm a sociologist here at Stanford. 
Uh, it struck me that um, a, a lot of the infrastructure of your thinking um, owes a substantial debt to several generations of feminist theorizing and research, which I didn't hear explicitly surfaced in your dialogue. And so I'm just wondering if you might think about how, as we continue to build this intellectual apparatus, we sort of recognize um, uh, the, the, the shoulders of, of, of the scholars we stand on. Thank you for saying Thank that. You, I, I wanted to mention Nancy Fulbury, who is the uh, yeah. feminist economist who's and led has been a part tremendous of this amount of that, yes, work, uh, and many, many others. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I would say, though, one of the things that, that, you know, that struck me starting to do the literature search and, and reading about this is there was this moment of the ethics of care within philosophy and psychology. There was this moment of saying, we need to have an ethics of care, and that's a feminist idea. There was not very much development of that that happened in the psychological or in the kind of standard philosophical literature, aside from just saying we need an, an ethics of care. Um, and if you read all the work that's been done in, in moral psychology, for instance, which has been an enormous topic over the past 20 years or so, Aside from just sort of saying, and, and feminists say that we need to have an ethics of care, all the kinds of questions that we've been raising haven't really been things that have been worked out empirically. Um, people may have been thinking about them, but the empirical questions about what people are doing and how they're thinking about it, those, those haven't been addressed using the empirical tools that are, are available in social science, to a very large degree at least. Was Carol Gilligan's work continued? No, I mean, that Carol That's Gilligan's the, work is a good example. Where Carol, first of all, Carol Gilligan's work turned out not to be very empirically well founded, um, and that became the kind of story about that. That became the story about that work, and it wasn't continued within the traditions of um, of psychology. So even though it was really important, if you look at contemporary moral psychology, um, <laughs> Margaret and I have had a. Uh, a bit of a joke about this as we've been involved in this project. So we turn to one field or in another and we say, gee, look, here's the moral psychologists and they're giving you this taxonomy of all the kinds of moral relationships. And there's no care. There's nothing about, there's nothing about care. In it. Why would that be? Is there any <laughs> common feature of the people who are doing this so this is the, that might explain? And now here's the economists, and they're giving you a taxonomy of all these. And, you know, no care. And no care. What, why is it that that hasn't happened? So I think it's true. It's been in the feminist tradition, but it hasn't made contact with the rest of the Especially the rest of the empirical I think in economics socialists. and actually in sociology as well, there's been a little more advance yeah. than that. Um, so in so, you know in economics, Nancy Fulbright's work, right. who you mentioned, has been foundational for a whole group of right. empirical economists, some of whom are men as well as women, mm -hmm. but trying to understand the relationships and the bargaining and contractual relationships within the family, and to some extent about care as well, following up on her. But don't you think in the, econ econ maybe we can have this conversation otherwise. It's not mainstream economics. It's right. not a dominant area, but it certainly has had follow-up. And, it, and it's been more like, let's take the foundational theoretical ideas about economics, like the social contract, and apply them to these cases like. Sometimes those, it's know. that, and sometimes it's more like what she's doing. Yeah. Um, and in sociology, you have people like Arlie Hochschild and others thinking yeah. about the habits of the heart. And there has been research, again, that builds on that, though it tends to be single case studies and sort of a certain kind of observational work that's very often hard to scale or at an extremely abstract level. Thank you very much for this uh, great discussion. So I'm Stéphane Vincent Lancrin. I work in mean, economics of education at the OECD. And you started the discussion by talking about you know, the importance of the political economy of care. And so my question is, in fact, you know, what you see as a role of governments in that, and the U.S. government in particular, I uh, would say that many countries would say that actually they provide incentives for people to care, you know, about their children, about their, you know, spouses, you know, with a lot of different laws, even to care about nature, you know, nowadays. So in the case of the U.S., you know, and you have different models for that, you know, in Sweden, it's, uh, you know, people care in a very different way than in uh, countries where you have um, 
law that come from Napoleon, for example. Uh, so what, in the case of the US, what do you see that you know, facilitates care or gets in the way of care and what oh. the governments can do about that? <laughs> How long that? do you have? <laughs> well, you know, Anne-Marie, I, I was reading your chapter and I wanted to ask you about, this was something I was thinking about at three o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep. Um, you know, markets and states are the models that we have for how we provide goods, and neither of them seems to be a very good fit for care, even though obviously markets and states are playing a big role. So what I was trying to think about is, if it's true that you're thinking about a relation, what's the sort of political economy way of dealing with that, right? I mean, aside from just saying relations are good and care is good and we should encourage it. And my thought is, Oddly enough, maybe something like just uh, give, the kind of giving people money, um, family allowances, the model of you just take people, you say you're a carer, you have responsibilities and privileges, and here's a whole bunch of money for you as an individual rather than, say, something that comes through a state. Oddly enough, that seems very like a very unsentimental choice, but that might be the right I mean, that does seem to be a way of saying, you're the individual, it's your relationship that we're supporting, you have autonomy over how you spend this money or what you do with it or how it plays out. And that So you've got two questions now. Is that a good idea? And yeah. is... So I'll just start with What's the, wrong the with America? obvious, um, <laughs> which is that, you know, this is just a horrific place to have a child if relative to any of our peer countries. It's just insane, you know. Rent uh, or to get old, yeah. Well, yes, but it, uh, uh, care, and I'll come to that in a minute. But child care for two children costs more than the cost of rent in all 50 states. It's just crazy. And you're, you are, of course, we're driving mostly women still out of the labor force, but it's, it's more than that. I mean, you, you literally, you find all these people, couples who say, yes, I'd love to have another child. I cannot afford to do it. It's a major drag on the employment market. And we just, you know, our, our, the hodgepodge that we have is just, is disgraceful. So the, the US government, at least when it comes to kids, when you looked at, um, the infrastructure of care, it was child care, elder care, paid family leave, which we still don't have, uh, and various other child supports. So uh, the, we've got a long way to go. So then what should we do? And here, so uh, it isn't always true that institutional care is better. Hillary Cottom, whom I've written with, uh, who wrote this wonderful book, Radical Help, you know, her point is that beverage, the beverage report actually th said, yes, there should be a state that provides all these supports, but actually that will only work if you also have a tremendous amount of civic activity. Yeah. So that there was a whole part that, that, that reintroduced the human scale into the government And the scale. cooperation, the, back yeah. to the yes. interdependence exactly. and the cooperation. So I, I, I don't think this is an argument that the state should provide. I think the question of how the state should support, and the state should provide some it's like it's like healthcare with a public option um, what new America is doing is arguing that families with children under five should be a protected or recognized class like seniors yeah now, I turned 65 this year and I have health care and I have Social yeah. Security and I get discounts and I've got my I just applied with the New York Metro you know I'm gonna be able to ride all over the place we have none of that for families with children under five. And yet from a policy point of view in terms of those children and what happens in the economy, so we, we think you should find lots of ways not to just give money to individuals, but to support strong family relationships. And then you get into foster care and you know all the sort of efforts to keep kids in their families and support the families. Why can't you actually pay for a person? If you can pay for a nurse in France to go <laughs> and be there, you know, why can't you pay for more than the social worker who shows up, you know, at, at, at intervals? But I think that that's again why I want to talk about an economy that values relationships and thinks about how to support them. Hi, I'm Seth Pollack. I'm a psychologist. Hi, everybody. Thank you for kicking this off with such a stimulating and thoughtful discussion. I'm curious, and maybe you've talked about this in prior discussions, when we, you talk about uh, 
you know, a, a, an adult, a parent has more resources and is supporting goals out of affection and love and all of these things. Is there a role for the selfish gene theory in your thinking that it, there is a biological or evolutionarily driven selfish investment in making sure our genes do well? And does that fit in with any of the So here's my, the yeah, my personal sort of story, which is like Sarah's, is if you're talking about mice, right, it's fairly clear that the set of neural and psychological phenomena that lead us to care for, for babies are, I mean, literally, being a mammal means that you give calories to your children. It's something that people, I think, don't quite recognize is that, you know, to be a mother is to be in in economic conflict with your baby by definition, um, if you're a mammal or if you're a bird too, but especially if you're a mammal. Um, then you get these, these psychological uh, devices that do this rather amazing thing, which is enable you to extend your utilities to another another organism, and obviously to begin with, that's motivated by the fact that you've got selfish genes and the, the babies are gonna survive. But what's interesting is very quickly, that exact same framework, even the hormones in the, as you guys know, the hormones in the brains get adapted to have pair-bonded fathers. So you have voles who are treating their spouses the same way that the moms, the mice moms would treat the babies. and. And my just so story is then you have carnivores who have more complicated social relationships and you have primates who have cooperation. And then you get this exacted uh, uh, use of these basic structures now in contexts where they're not about selfish genes at all. Now in contexts where it is really good for a bunch of primates to cooperate or it's really good for a carnivore, a carnivore pack to help each other to accomplish things until you get to humans where it's good for us as humanity to support the future and to care for each other. So anyway, that's my just so story about it. So I do think it starts out being, being grounded in evolution, but it very quickly becomes a structure that enables, just like social contracts, right? I mean, I think you have good reason to believe that you start developing these contractual capacities very early, and there's good reasons for doing it. But once you have that structure, then you can use it to do things that you didn't ever do in the context, like, you know, have a, have a giant planet-spanning market that you obviously didn't have in the context to the, in which you evolved. But anyway, that's a... Important, deep question, but but there are societies in which people are taking care of other people's children, right? So it's not just about. I mean, it can't. That doesn't mean it isn't the selfish gene because you're still perpetuating something that you care about. No, but about. that's what, I, what I'm saying, Margaret. Is if you're not a mouse, then I think it's not just the selfish. It's not just the selfish gene. Right. And as soon as you're, if Sarah's right, as soon as you're homo sapiens. Sarah Hardy. Sarah Hardy. So, but, but Sarah you know. Hardy, I, was just, I just was reading her book, Mother Nature, her original book, right, where she's, the whole point is to show that, that some notion of great maternal love and affection just does not hold in the, 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 in the animal kingdom and in the insect kingdom and the avian kingdom that, that there are, you know, mothers are highly, highly strategic creatures who uh, will, will uh, act Actually, that argument is much closer to the selfish gene. And I, I, this goes back to Megan's question. I recognize all that. I also think that at least for humans, there is something very special about the ways in which we attach. I mean, an, lots of animals mate for life too, but that, but that there's something there that, it help, that our, it's in our brains. It care get, caregivers get something as well as giving something. It's deeply satisfying. And those are the pieces I still think we need to well, tease I, out. I'm having trouble thinking of it as just biology, that I think it's also the ways in which societies develop themselves and the kinds of norms that they inculcate into the society. So I want to thank both of you, Anne-Marie Slaughter and Alison Gopnik, and all of you who came and participated. Yes. So thank you very much. This was a great way to start our conference. Thank you. <laughs> that was Margaret Levy, Alison Gopnik, and Anne-Marie Slaughter discussing the social science of caregiving. 
As always, you can follow us online or in your podcast app of choice. And if you're interested in learning more about the Center's people, projects, and rich history, you can visit our website at casbs.stanford.edu. Until next time, from everyone at CASBIS and the Human Centered Team, thanks for listening.